Do you know the content creator, Mr. Given? Yes. Probably him. I do exactly yep. what he did. Grinding out on Twitch is not the strategy now. There is no way that that would be the strategy. Probably something about, I would honestly say something along the lines of focusing on shorts to just get your, get some content out there that's actually going to get views. Because like, you put out a YouTube video, unless it's something that no one's seen before, no one's really going to click it. No one cares about your opinion unless you're known. Um, there's, there's YouTube videos, guides out there way better than mine. People still click mine because they know who I am. Right. Um, then, yeah, so I would say the shorter for format content is way better um, at this moment for discoverability. And then the hardest part is transitioning that into actual, you know, like a actual community. More importantly, are you happy? You're good? No, I'm good. I'm good. Morning, everyone. It is early. It's uh, 3.47 in the morning. Oh, dear Lord. The things you don't do for your community and, and BSG, man. Is this where you're allowed to swear? Are you allowed to swear on this podcast or this interview? Well, you can swear if you want. Um, Top of the yeah. fucking morning, everyone. Top there of the go. fucking morning. Excellent. All right. Well, welcome, Pest. Welcome to Tardux, and thank you for BSG for uh, for doing this. Really appreciate this. So the um, Tar Tardux podcast is a podcast for content creators to come on, share their stories, experiences, and advice. And I have, you know, the legend, Pestilli. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Happy you're here, dude. How were the holidays? Did you have a good holiday? It was really good. I, I was expecting a warp to happen before it. So then that way I was like, I was worried that, you know, I'd be busy doing, uh, doing warp stuff. But thankfully, Nikita decided that the day after Christmas was the better date to do it. So then I actually got to spend some time with my family. So nice. And how was, how was first Christmas as a dad? Got a good, got a good meal in. We actually, um, I'm actually training out for a marathon, so I'm trying to eat healthy. So I actually lost weight over Christmas. Oh, wow. I'm pretty happy about that. But um, yeah. Excellent. All right. So what we normally do is we start things off with three random questions to get the juices flowing. So are you ready? My juices are ready. All right. Here we go. So toughest thing about being a dad? Um, time management. The thing that like, you know, oh, I'll just go and watch a TV show. That doesn't happen. I've, I've struggled to watch any sort of, TV or movies or anything since being a dad. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. Second question. What was the most interesting thing you saw in your trip to Texas? Good question. Batty. <laughs> <laughs> Batty's a legend, actually. Is it? Um, dude, like, Texas was amazing. It was so many cool things. It, yeah. it really was just chill. I actually thought it would be a lot more like, in the movies, but it was actually a lot better uh, than what I like. I actually preferred if I had to go back to either t San Diego or Texas, I'd go back to Texas. Yeah, um, nice. there was so much cool stuff. Uh, look, catching up with all, all the gun nuts that was awesome. Um, San, San Antonio was a beautiful city. Fuck, I don't know. What, what was the question again? What was the most? What was, this, what was the most interesting thing you saw in Texas? Hmm. I don't know. I, honestly, it, it was just very different uh, style of life to what I'm used to. Yeah. All right. And the third question, real or fake Christmas tree? Which path do you go down? Uh, I, I can't show you my screen behind, behind me, but I have a fake Christmas tree. Okay. You, you can get real ones in Australia, but it's really messy. Like, yeah. I don't know many people that get the real ones, even though they do it every year. Yeah. All right. If you see them for sale, I just, I don't know anyone who's bought it. Yeah. Yeah. Like even when I had that pod with uh, the Australian folks, yeah, there was like, everybody was just fake Christmas trees, except for Rhino. That was it. He had a, a real one and that's, that was it out of the crew. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, um, not one of the things that I would, I would buy. Yeah. All right. So last time we, we chatted, you know, I had, we had the team and no Anton, but he had, did have some questions for us and, uh, it was good to catch up with you then and, and nice to see you again, dude. How's everything going? Always good to see you. Been really busy. Um, I'm trying to just balance out life so I can actually be a dad as well. Like a bit talking yeah. about that time management stuff. So um, this is the first year I've actually put a structure together of the of how I'm going to work. Yeah. Um, I'm actually not working weekends anymore. I'm, I've, I'm not doing a nine to five. I'm doing a four to four. 
Yeah. So 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. is my work hours. So I'm a little bit early today. <laughs> Don't hold it against you. Um, but yeah, 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. is my work hours. I can work every minute of those hours. But at 4 p.m. it's time to go home. Yeah. Um, and I do that Monday to Friday. So I've got a 60-hour work week. And then outside of that, it's it's time for mum and bubs pretty much. So that way I can and, and enjoy time with them. But in this year, um, I'm doing the trip that I wanted to do in 2020. So the European um, that was a, one? Correct. So with... Uh, with uh we, my wife and i sat down last year and we're like i always want to do that 2020 trip and i'm gonna be 60 years old one day going i freaking wish i did it so we put a plan together so how i could do my own version of it next week and uh so next week next week next year yeah. and now it's 20 now it's this year so the idea is um i'm doing three five-week trips and each of those trips are for different areas of, of europe Oh, wow. And I'm going to be going pretty hard. There's a group of four of us. Michael, my neighbor, Stir Decky, which is another content creator on Twitch. Yeah. And also a guy named Jared, who's a Canadian, who lives okay. in Australia. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now, all right, let's talk Michael for a second. So do you think Michael had any idea what he was in for when he moved in next to you or you moved in next to him? I moved in next to him. Like, it wasn't like right next door. It was about, uh, you're talking eight. I don't know, a couple hundred feet down the road. Yeah. It's like a dozen houses down the road. Um, probably not even that, actually. Um, so, yeah. Uh, to be honest, he thought I was unemployed because when I met him, I met him at a, at a, it was like a music gig for Nathan Cavallari. Yeah. And uh, after a more, we were talking to Nathan and he's, Michael and his wife were selling the merchandise for Nathan. And so then they came up and we started talking. And uh, yeah, they, we just realized that we live literally right next door to each other. Yeah. And because of that, we're like, oh, let's uh, hang out. So I invited him around for a barbecue one time. And then after that, um, yeah, he just said, oh, what do you do? Oh, I, go, I, play, I play video games. And he goes, oh, fair enough. And we would just play board games and watch the football together. Yeah. Like he thought I was unemployed because obviously who the fuck <laughs> just plays video games. Right. Um, so, yeah. And then, then slowly you know. our, our friendship built and now he's <laughs> sleeping in my spare room. <laughs> Yeah, little did he know he'd be on camera drinking beers from all over the world, involved in skydiving adventures with a gaming chair, uh, mu music videos. Waxed. Yeah, it's been good fun. Oh yeah, you guys play well off each other. It's it's a it's it makes for really fun fun videos. We we actually sat down last night and watched probably about three hours of YouTube videos of people that have been traveling just yeah. to get. It wasn't even like inspiration, but just. We're looking at camera angles mostly. Like, yeah. how do they film it? Like, what what's their filming tactics? We really want to do a good trip. Um, we're going to start a new YouTube channel for that, where we're going to um, just tell the story. It's not really about you know getting views or making money or anything. It's right. literally just to tell a good story. Um, so at the end of the trip, I've got the idea is to have a dozen of them, a dozen yep. stories from the trip. And uh, just something I'm proud of, a piece of work that is just, yeah. if anyone was like, what, what have you done in your life? I'd be like, that's my, my, my work, my masterpiece. Nice. That should be good, man. And how many Not to mention all the other shit I've done. Oh, God. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, three. Work and everything. Okay, three. Awesome, man. Three trips. And, uh, do, you have the, do you have the areas of Europe that you're sort of targeting? Literally everything. The first trip will be southeast. Yeah. Um, so everything east of Italy. So from Italy all the way down to uh turkey up to ukraine and then yeah back across to italy oh, wow. so there's about there's about 15 countries in there we'll probably get to about 12 of them yeah. each trip the aim is about to, to do about 10 to 12. yeah nice uh after the first trip will the second trip will be mostly the northern part so the first trip's in march april so it's a bit a bit cooler still yeah. um but march april sorry the second trip will be june july and it'll be nice and warm so we're going to go to the UK, um, including Scotland. Someone's oh, like, wow. are you going to go to Scotland? I'm like, that's in the UK. Um, <laughs> so go to UK, Ireland, Northern Ireland, go across to Greenland, across to Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark. I think we'll probably do Austria or Poland in that trip. Um, and that'll be about that trip. That's a, that, The problem with that trip is uh, Sweden... Finland and Norway, we've got a lot of driving to do. There's a lot of yeah. things we want to do there. Um, so we'll probably get bogged down for maybe even 
10, 15 days just on those two, through those three countries. But yeah. besides those countries, we can punch out the UK in like a fucking 15 minute drive. It's not big at all. Yeah. <laughs> and now, are you planning on uh, doing any mountain climbing too? I think last time we talked, that whole was time. Be... Oh, wow. Okay. So we'll be going to climb in the highest mountains of each country as we're going and then getting stories from in between. Oh, and yeah. then the third trip, we're going to Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg, probably do Portugal, Spain. Um, I'm missing stuff, but kind of like the third trip, we've got about a two to three week area not planned yet, just so yeah. we can go like, what do we miss? What do we wish we could see better? Yeah. Um, Man, it's going to be cool. It's huge. It's, it's a big endeavor, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Cool. And the next All week right. I go to Indonesia. Oh, wow. so, what's happening down there? Well, it's a, it's a bit of a trial run. We're all going to catch up. We're going to go climb a volcano. Okay. Uh, so I want to live stream. Oh, by the way, this is all live streamed. Um, I, I want to climb a volcano next. It'll be literally the end of next week we go there. Should be climbing a volcano. Um, and then we'll have about three days of live streaming through the markets and, yeah. and the cultural sites. Um, but it's more just an opportunity for us to really figure out what equipment we're taking. Test run and yeah, and just get everything ready to go. Yeah. So now, did you ever think, you know, from that first time you hit that go live button, your life would bring you to this path now where you could do some of this really cool shit? Um, so when I first clicked go live, my goal was make friends was the first thing I wanted to do because I was very lonely after leaving the army. Yeah. Um, didn't have a lot of friends where I lived. Well, I had no friends where I lived. And uh, most of my friends that played video games didn't play video games anymore. So the first objective was to make friends. Made a lot of friends, big tick there. Um, and then the second objective was to try and build a following for my Europe trip. Because I was always doing the Europe trip. Oh, okay. Um, and I was like, if I got to 20,000 followers, I think that'd be a pretty good goal. You know, I've got three years. Yeah. You know, uh, when I went to Europe, I had... 800,000, so. It's amazing. And now speaking of before you went live, so you, you served in the military. That was your, uh, how many years did you do that? Eight, a little bit over eight years. Yeah. And then prior to the military, I think you, were you fire in the fire department? No, after I left the military, I, I joined up as a firefighter. Okay. There's, depending on where you are, there's, um, there's full-time firefighters and there's what's called part-time. There's yeah. also volunteer. It's different to volunteer. Part-time, you still get paid. And you're part of the Metropolitan Fire Service, um, but uh, so you're held to a different standard. But the you're not needed there because we service like an area of maybe like three or four thousand people. Yeah. It's enough to need a dedicated fire service, but not so much that um, you know you need uh, you know someone there twenty four seven. So yeah, uh, I did that part time whilst I started my streaming career. Nice. And now from a video game standpoint, where did video games start for you? Like, you know, late in your teens or was it like, you know, early years? I, I grew up as a kid playing video games, but it was more like, I don't know, like I played like stuff from Atari to Commodore 64, yeah. Sega Mega Systems, like the old school ones. Um, but it didn't really tank off. The, I remember the first computer game I played was Total Annihilation. Yes. Um, and then it, like that got me into RTS games and then it really got up. It, I really got into it with Half-Life. Half-Life yeah. was where my, I got fully into like being addicted to video games. Yeah. Um, but then I also played a lot of console games. So, you know, from the Nintendo, Super Nintendo, I'd never played an, I never owned an N64, yeah. but a, uh, a PlayStation one, holy shit. I played like so many games that. <laughs> Might have, might have been helpful that a mate had a uh, little CD-ROM burner. Oh, nice! Um, but, yeah. <laughs> but but I played a lot of I played a lot of PlayStation games. Yeah, nice. Speaking of um, Total Annihilation, the, I just was reading yesterday. There's a new version coming, or a, some freeware version coming that looks amazing. So that one had a special, well, I, yeah. Yeah, that that is. It, to me, it was just one of those games that was like I, I never played against players, obviously, because was yeah there was no internet back then. Or right. if it was, it was just by the elite, I guess. But yeah, um, they played. They had Supreme Commander that came out after it. And yeah. For me, that was uh, those two games. I played a lot, a lot. Yeah, nice. And over the years, what were the games that really stuck out for you? Half Life, one of your favorites. 
I played Half Life probably more than any game until Tarkov. Yeah. Um, because it was one of those games that you all your mates would bring their computers around and you could all play all yeah. night. And then once internet got good enough, like I had like a two hundred ping, but um, on dial up. But like I played that game so much online, yeah. and then uh, Counter Strike got on the scene. But I played all the mods, so Half Life yeah. includes like Day Defeat. Oh yeah. Uh, like was it what was the one where it was uh, natural selection team fortress it was so many I, I i can't think of them all you got me on the spot like all those <laughs> mods i played and then obviously counter-strike counter-strike i used to play against bots by myself yeah so much um and then uh yeah then the normal like the local tournaments started happening yeah i don't have them out at the moment because i'm still starting to set up this house but i've got all the local tournaments so i've got like um medallions yeah. And winning all the tournaments and oh, stuff. Nice. Um, it was actually this really cool one. I, I spoke about this somewhere and they actually contacted me. Like one of the guys had, had watched my stream or a video or something. Yeah. It was this, this, there was this land party called the POV smash up. They're, they're the prisoners of violence mm -hmm. and uh, the POV, POV smash land. And it, it was, if you won the tournament, the, the prize was they got an old CRT monitor. It was yeah. just the old big brick monitors. Right. And yeah. then they had a sledgehammer. <laughs> and you could, the winner got to smash the CRT monitor with a sledgehammer. And I shit you not, hitting that with a sledgehammer is the bassiest sound. It's so cool. Yeah, but like we sealed and it's a vacuum tube and yeah, big old pop. But the thing was, like, this is before like OHS existed, right? Like, yeah. So, like, we're like kids. Like, I was like 14, <laughs> 15 years old when I'm winning these tournaments. And like, you'd smash it in glass and be going everywhere. We'd be doing it on a school oval at night time, like, no lighting. <laughs> No good lighting. It was just, yeah, it was pretty funny. Oh, my Lord. And now, you know, when it comes to the streaming, what were the first few games you started to stream? I've only really streamed Tarkov from the start. Oh, okay. I started playing Tarkov with streaming. So, oh, like, no it was, it was, uh, I bought Tarkov in June 2017. I was like, oh, this is too expensive. I'm not going to buy the EOD. Because yeah. before June 2017, you had to have EOD to play it. Like, there was just no way. And yeah. I was like 140 US dollars. That's like 230 Australian. There's right. no way I'm spending that kind of money on a on a, on Tarkov. Yeah. Um, particularly when like you you had no real footage of what it was like. I remember right. popping into someone's stream, but it was like this is before I even really knew what Twitch was. Yeah. Um, but then I I uh, I went away with the army for my last like two months. I went overseas and, and translated, and uh, I came back. A civilian literally like on the plane i was like i'm a civilian now i shouldn't be on this plane anymore <laughs> um and uh i get back and we i moved out to the country and i was like all right i'm gonna play this game and i'm gonna try um i'm gonna try to play tarkov so that was the first yeah. time i played tarkov oh man now how did you find the game what was your path to the game was it you know some friends or just some videos you saw i don't remember someone in someone in the army told me about the game because everyone was really really keen on PUBG at the time. Yeah. And they're like, oh, you should check out this game. This game from Target. I got no idea who it was. I got a feeling I know who it was. Um, but so that's not true. I don't, I do have an idea that of who it could be. Yeah. Um, but I remember just checking it out and going, oh, I'll just think about that. Yeah. And now what, in, in the end, what was the thing that uh, Tarkov had that hooked you into it? Everything. Okay. The, at the very start, it reminded me of Half-Life. Yeah. So if you ever play Factory back in the day, it was very fast paced. Like it was, and it wasn't like you died in the first bullet. There was no head, there was no face hitbox. So yeah. if someone was wearing a Kiva, which was the best helmet in the game, um, if someone was wearing a, a Kiva and you shot them in the face, they didn't die in one bullet. So you'd be running around Factory and uh, you'd hear them and you'd try and flank them. It was very positional based and, and tactical. So yeah. I love the fact of that. It was, like, I'm not a huge gun that. Like, I love shooting guns and, and all that kind of stuff, but the optimization, sorry, the customization of guns wasn't really the big draw to me. It was the actual, um, the combat. So yeah. then I I, got, I played, because it was, when I started playing, there was Factory, Custom, Shoreline, and Woods. Woods was nothing like it is now. It was half yeah. the size. Even the lumber mill looked not, uh, totally different. Shoreline was half the map. There was no resort. Everything oh, wow. everything to the, to the tunnel side of resort yeah. was pretty similar. Like you had the cottages and the swamp area and the village, that was it. That was the whole shoreline and down to the pier. The extracts yeah. were the pier and the tunnel, uh, the, the 
the the bunker near the tank. Um, that was the whole shoreline. Yeah. And um, customs was extremely narrow. Like there was no um, boiler. The, the whole boiler side was a lot smaller. There was no, um, you know, stronghold. Yeah. Even the skeleton, skeleton building in the middle of the map, that was never there. Um, yeah. Even that northeast oh. corner was sort of shut. You couldn't go up there either. At hillside, there was none of yeah. that either. So there was actually a point where at New Gas, that bridge was the only place you could cross to get to the other side of the map. Yeah. So what I would end up doing is spending half my map, half my raid in that area because everyone had to pass it to extract. So you would literally yeah. fight every player that came through the map. It was it was a totally different game um, back then because it, yeah. it was it was very... Uh, pvp orientated mm -hmm. because it was just so narrow and there wasn't that much gear to pick from like yeah. hey you've got a kiva and a and a fort armor which is the 6b43 now that was yeah. all the that was the best gear in the game um until they started adding the fast mt i think was the next helmet um so it was like back then it was just all about combat and moving around and positioning and it was a lot of fun yeah and now, you know, if, if somebody's getting into the game today, how what kind of advice would you give them? How would they? How should they approach Tarkov? Probably don't look at streamers and say I should be able to play like that. That would be the worst thing to do. Yeah. The, the, Tarkov is one of those games where you'll get what out of it what you want. You know, in respect of uh, you go into a game, appreciate the highs with the lows. So. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're going to go into a raid and you'll find flash drive and that will be the coolest feeling. Like, oh my God, I got the flash drive. I've got to get out. And then your heart's racing. And you're yeah. like, I've got to get out of this raid. I've got to get out of this raid. I've got to get out of this raid. And, and that is like the most, um, that is like an exciting experience. And then you'll die. Yeah. And you're like, so you got a really high high followed by a low. Yes. Most games don't give you anything. Like most games you'll play and you'll sit there and like, you know, and it's like, well, at least you got to feel something during this fucking game. And right. I think that's probably one of the things that's really uh, important about Tarkov. Like, if you if you want like hard advice, like ammo is more important than the gun. Uh, you know, every everyone dies. You know, just like understand that everyone dies in Tarkov, yep. and knowledge is more important than fucking being able to click heads in Tarkov. Yeah. But um, but in all seriousness, like you don't play video games to, or most people don't play video games to be the world's best. Like if they do in Tarkov, you're never going to be there because it's just not possible because um, there's no way to, to determine that. But with, but with Tarkov, it gives you a lot of feeling, in my opinion, just appreciate the highs with the lows. And and the first time that you kill, um, the first time you kill a geared player, uh, you'll have that excitement like, oh my God, I just killed a geared player. Yeah. And then you go up to that person, you go to loot them and you're like, holy fuck, what is this gear? I've never seen this gear. This is insane. And you're, you, you just, you're excited. You're exhilarated. You, you know, all those great feelings. You don't get that normally in other video games. No. And, um, Tarkov's the best at replicating that kind of feeling. The, the, the problem is it's like chasing the fucking dragon, right? Like for, for someone like me, like I think I just about hit 10,000 hours streamed with Tarkov. Yeah. Um, and that's not including all the stuff I've done off stream. Um, for me to get that same feeling, something pretty crazy has to happen. Like I have to, I have to find a couple of really important items and get attacked by players, and you know have a near death experience. Whilst also there's an earthquake happening at my house, just to <laughs> like even feel a sense of like you know yeah. sensation. That, that's what I was just going to ask you. After the, you know thousands of hours you have into this, you know, do do your does your heartbeat get up there? Does the adrenaline? Does the pucker factor happen? anymore or you just need a whole bunch of things now um not a lot oh i i generally have my most enjoyable experiences now from voip yeah um literally the game itself i, I this wipe i've been very frustrated at scabs but um <laughs> in general like i don't really get those same sensations because mm -hmm. i've played it so much i'm desensitized to it and that's just yeah. a natural uh, outcome of playing a video game so much uh, and it says people out there after 10,000 hours that can that are like screaming with excitement good on them I, I, I envy you uh but for me it's like if I have a really cool interaction that makes my day yeah you know like if I if I 
I, I don't know, like I shot at someone yesterday or the day before and he, cause I, I said, Hey man, I'm just trying to get something done. And, and, and he, and he killed the scav near me and I wasn't sure if he was going to shoot at me or not. So he, he, he poked his head out and I shot at him and he screamed at me like, you fucking piece of shit. Like, you know, like, <laughs> Oh, you reckon said cease fire. And, and I'm like, sorry. And then I'm like, I'm running. He's like, get back here. And, and like, to me, that is like a hundred times more exciting to me now than yeah. if I killed a guy straight without even talking. You yeah. know, like if I just went and then he, I killed him or, you know, like he you know, kills me or whatever. Like yeah. I just don't feel any excitement from that anymore. Um, if I'm getting spawned by a squad, it still gets some excitement, but you, you yeah. get the point. Like it's yeah. VoIP should be in every video game, in my opinion, if it can, if it's suitable. If that yeah. makes sense. Like, yeah. When VoIP was announced, there was a lot of people were nervous about it, but it has, ex, you know, just uh, accelerated the excitement and added so much to the to the game. Yeah, I honestly think um, I think it should have been in the game sooner. Yeah. I, like, I, okay, like, go watch a YouTube video or a highlight of, of anything, and if there's no VoIP involved, you've all already seen it. Like, don't yeah. you think? Like, you've in Tarkov, it's pretty much now at the point where it's like I've already seen something like this. Yeah. But then you add the VoIP, the the VoIP interaction is like that changes any every video now. Yeah, it does. It really does. And now, so when you approach, you know, wipes, what is your wipe strategy? Do you go questing? Do you just look for the new stuff? So, um, back in like 2018 to like 2019, I was all about get to everything done as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, I remember I. In 2019, I think it was when Reserve came out. I think it was October 2019. And um, when Reserve came out, my, I didn't even play Reserve until I had Max Traders. Like, and I did it pretty quick. It took me about a day or two. Yeah. But I was like, get my stuff done, then focus on the new content. Um, and that was like just I used I I loved the I used to play a lot of Path of Exile before Tarkov as well. Yeah. Even at the early days of Tarkov, still played it off stream. Um. And they got like speed running events and, and all that kind of stuff. So I actually really enjoy not even a, it's not about beating other people. It's it's about doing the game as efficiently as possible myself. Yeah. Um, so generally it's just racing myself. I used to do on stream, I used to race myself to see how fast I could get max traders. I think the fastest I ever did was 12 hours and 20 minutes with assistance. Oh my and God. I think 17 hours without. Um, so and I'm tempted to do it again. I'm yeah. I'm very tempted to do it again with assistance just to see how fast um, with all the newest changes. Yeah. But um, it was never about beating other people. Yeah. Uh, it was all just about me seeing if I could do it, like getting to 40 in one stream, you know, and that was like really hard back in the day. There oh wasn't that God. many quests. Um, but yeah, so now uh, the most recent wipe, I did one raid of, woods to get um jaeger unlocked and then i did the yeah. first 80 80 raids on streets and i just explored it i looked at every building had a heap of fun the only reason i stopped doing streets around the 80 raid mark was um my prepper wouldn't level up because uh i did the pistol kill quest i think it was dear it and it, it reduced my rep with prepper and it wouldn't go to the next level oh, and shoot. i wanted the, i wanted the um I wanted to be able to use Prepper on the next level. So I think I did a couple of Prepper quests real quick and then got back on the streets for another probably 30 raids or 40 raids before I go on with um, other quests. Yeah. Okay. And now overall, what's your thoughts on this new patch on streets and, you know, everything? There's a half an hour rant video <laughs> if you're really <laughs> interested. <laughs> I, I, I remember TLDR. recording the video and I looked at the fucking time and I'm like, holy shit, I've been ranting for half an hour. Um, I think the first like nine minutes of the video is the positives and there's like 20 minutes of just ranting. Yeah. Um, look, the, all the new content is great. Content wise, they hit the mark a hundred percent. The, the issues are obvious with stuff like, um, you know, the lag rubber banding and desync of streets. Yeah. The sound is so confusing now. It's impossible to tell when I hear sound now, I go, yep, someone's here. Yeah. <laughs> that is all it's really the only <laughs> games you got and then um and then the scavs have done something to the scavs and they this if you not you you have to pay attention now to a scav 
it's no longer just, oh, that's a scav over there. I'll just go and kill him. It's like, right. that's a scav over there. I'm going to hide behind this cover, slow peek <laughs> out, and take a well-aimed shot. Otherwise, I'm fucking losing my armor or dying here. Yeah. Um. So, and I don't agree with that at all. So, for example, I spoke in my video, but there's like a, a, a scale of like AI in the game. Like, scab boss is right on the far end of the spectrum. We're right. being like a killer. Like, you see killer, you're like, I'm in the fucking, I've got to bring my A game. Yeah. Seeing a scab should not be like, oh, I'm about to fight fucking killer. I need to bring my A game. Obviously, you should give a fuck, but not in that. So, the, the idea I've got, or my my thoughts about scams in Tarkov should really be post, based around, um, they should be giving away your position. They should be uh, an inconvenience, not a, mm -hmm. a massive threat. So, like, if I'm running past and a scab sees me and he shoots at me, the first half a dozen shots should just miss. Like, right. or, or at least, like, maim at most. Because the, um, the idea is it gives away my position to other players, so then... It incites more PvP. Yeah. If I see a raider or a goon, different story. Those ones should fuck up, they fuck me up straight away. They should be yeah. like, "Holy shit, that's a raider or a goon. I need to get it, get a cover and run or fight him." You know, like, um, and the um, and the, I think a perfect example that happened, I think yesterday or the day before, I bumped into a player. We had an like an engagement. I was talking where I ran, I was like, no, nah, I, I can't take this guy on. I start running away. And then I walk around a corner and I hear a scape of chup, chup, like, you know, you know, like says, he said a word. I can't remember yeah. what fucking word it was. And then instantly killed me. Like it was like a double PS round of the chest. Yeah. And it was like, hang on, this player was chasing me. I'm now, this whole scenario has been ruined by just a, a random scab that was on the map that instantly beamed me. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I, it's just, yeah, it breaks, it breaks what could have been a really great experience into yeah. just frustration. Yeah, it breaks that immersion that you that Tarkov brings so well. Yeah, yeah. like they're, they're they're dialed in way too much. Like another thing that happened yesterday was like I was on Lighthouse, I was on the way to the extract, um, and the guy in the fifty cal, the AI on the fifty cal, shot me through the fuel tanker. Yeah. Like, you could see the sparks coming through the fuel tanker as he shot me. And it's like, what the fuck? Like, that's not... It's just stupid. Like, it's... Yeah. So, whilst... I, I've ranted very hard, even just here, but <laughs> overall, the content side of things are great. I loved how they implemented the hideout. The hideout yeah. um, with the wall. They didn't just mm -hmm. make it say, hey, just upgrade your fucking hideout. You'll have the gym all sweet, you know, yada, yada, yada. No, they made it like a bit of an event. Like, oh, there's like a whispering wall and it's like seeping out moisture onto the floor yeah. and what what is going on here like we all kind of guessed it would be the gym right. one there but you know you never know it could be a dead body just like you in, don't know yeah you just don't know um but like a new player or someone who doesn't keep up to date with all the latest information yeah. would be like what the fuck is this wall <laughs> um so yeah you know like i think that's really uh, a really cool way of implementing a, a new part of the game and mm -hmm. i like the fact that they made it so there's enough room to put more stuff in there um yeah. the the firing range awesome addition have you seen it at level two and three yet no i haven't okay so the firing range at level two has um like you know your paper targets that you can yeah. bring in and out yeah so they've got the paper targets and you can oh, like cool. shoot them and you can reset them you can uh there'll be at different distances they've got little computer monitors that you can watch the far distance targets it's actually really cool yeah. And then um, at level three, it's a full fucking like pop up system. You can have oh, like no a, a, where it like, moves stuff around. It's actually yeah. really well done. Um, probably better than I've seen in most games. Yeah. And uh, it's got like a scoring system in that if you want to do like the scoring system, but at least with the, uh, if you just want to try out some guns yeah. or choose to, it's a really great way of practicing your hip fire without. Yeah. Um, like point fire if you don't want to use a laser and stuff and mm -hmm. people are like how do i get better at, at, at uh hip fire point firing the pop-up targets is a great scenario because that way literally as they're popping up you can be like turn You're shoot moving. shoot shoot and there's even got ones uh, that are like the paper ones standing up top so really really good way of um, practicing your point firing so i think that's going to be or it is an, a massive a great addition yeah. to the game um treats best map in the game um 
The only reason I don't see it overwhelmed by by the, the nasty cheetah boys is yeah. the fact that the loot's not the greatest, but at the moment that's kind of good. It gives me an opportunity to explore. Right, yeah, absolutely. But well, that's by saying the loot's not the greatest, there's still plenty of loot on the map. It's just barter trade items, food, weapon crates. You've got to actually search for it. It's yeah. not just run to this point and grab all this high-tier loot. Mm -hmm. It's not like farming labs or anything like that. You've got to explore. Correct. Yeah, right. nice. And now, you know, first, your first few runs, your first few raids, how do you, what, are you grabbing the M4 and you just going in and, or do you, you know, what is your start, starting loadout for the first couple of runs? I went bare and I pretty much just pressed ready. I think, <laughs> I think I just made sure I had all my meds and then I just yeah. pretty much went ready. Yeah. Not oh, nice. Oh man. I, I, yeah. I don't, I don't think I did anything different because yeah. I just wanted to get in there. Like, you know. Right. It's exciting. <laughs> what about the <laughs> yeah, everybody was pumped up for streets, and we probably saw a lot of you know old people return to just see what what it was, what the excitement was going to be. Pretty much. Yeah. Now back to streaming for a little bit, you know. So you you made you went live to make friends and whatnot. So over the the months and whatnot, you saw your viewership grow and and whatnot. How was that first time you got rated? Your numbers went from X to triple X, like you know. I, were you prepared for that growth or it was just like? Um, before I had partner, my biggest host was about 40 people. Yeah. I, I, I grinded. I grinded really hard. I made, I made a YouTube video every day, five yeah. days a week. Oh, sorry. For, I made a YouTube video for five days a week and I streamed eight hours a day, pretty much every day. And I constantly, best thing you can do if you're a content creator out there, get a notebook and pen, put it down next to your fucking desk where you can reach while you're streaming. And if anyone has any actual constructive criticism, put the fucking note down and work on it later. I honest, honestly, I just, after every stream, I just kept trying to improve stuff. Hey, your green screen's flickering a little bit. Like, see how my arm will like disappear yeah. here? Because I'm just using the, the Zoom background right. drop. But like, you know, like I would make sure that's fixed for the next one or, you know, like anything you could improve, always try to improve. Treat it like a business, you know? But yeah, um, I think the biggest host that I can remember early on, I, I'm only guessing, I know Clean and that hosted me a few times early or, or Smoke. Um, like I'm saying, when I had a couple of hundred viewers at this point. Yeah. But the, uh, the mem I remember the biggest one was Shroud, which would have been around 2018, yeah. 2019. And, I, and Shroud hosted me with about 10,000. Oh. And... Uh, one of the things I can give you as advice, if if I or someone that's got sizable numbers raids you, um, first thing you should do is get into a raid. The very yeah. first thing. They don't want to see you sitting on a menu saying thank you. Um, so what I did was I was literally putting my loadout on and I, I rushed the rest of the loadout and I just sla slapped into into labs. Yeah. And I got into labs and I, I shit you not. It was like, have you seen Old School with Will Ferrell? Yes. So you know how it's like um, he's doing the debate and he's like switch it like goes into a different state of humanity yeah. and then he just like rifles off a heap of things for the debate. That was right. me on Labs that raid. I, I literally was running around with like an MP7, killed all the players, killed all the raiders, all in the first like five minutes. And everyone was just like, what did I just see? Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm confident there's probably still people that are following me from that day <laughs> because I actually showed them what I was capable of and yeah. I showed them some cool stuff. Um, so cool. that's probably the best thing that you can do if you get a big raid is get into a raid, talk the whole time, explain who you are and what's going on and where you're up to and all that stuff. But don't just sit there and say, thank you for the followers. Thank you for the, like, be courteous to the host. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the raid. Hope an amazing stream. Yada, yada, yada. Get into a raid. Yeah. So two things. The Twitch partner, when you hear your Twitch partner story, but first, so you're starting out uh, fresh today, your first time going live. How would you approach it today versus back then? Any different or knowing what you know, focus more on the YouTube side of things, shorts, what what would your strategy be? Do you know the content creator, Mr. Gibbon? Yes. Probably him. I'd do exactly yep. what he did. Grinding out on Twitch is not the strategy now. There is no way that that would be the strategy. Um... Probably something about I would honestly say something along the lines of focusing on shorts to just get your get some content out there that's actually going to get views because like you put out a YouTube video unless it's something that no one's seen before no one's really going to click it no one cares about your opinion unless you're known 
um there's there's youtube videos guides out there way better than mine people still click mine because they know who i am right um then yeah so i would say the shorter format content is way better um at this moment for discoverability and then the hardest part is transitioning that into actual um you know like a actual community i think right. uh i can't remember where i was i think it was an interview with mr beast's manager but um the issue a lot of the tiktok creators are having is they'll have you know like three million followers on tiktok but then no one will actually be following them as a community member so they'll do a like a merch drop or something like that and no one will actually buy it or oh, okay. anything like that so yeah all right and now your twitch partner story how did you you know when did you find out and you know yeah i guess how did you find out what was the story I want to make more com one more comment because I, I feel like it, it, it reiterates to you and I think you could actually benefit from this. You don't have to take the advice. But like, even if you're doing a podcast, like you should be putting out shorts. Yeah. Like, I'm not a big fan of like, you know, just, oh, shorts is the way. It, there, there is other ways, but you've already got the content. You just got to get a couple of snippets, put it out as a short. Exactly. YouTube's done a really good job now that separates shorts on the feed from from uh, from the main thing. So it's like, why not? Yeah. Um. You know, so... Yeah, actually, uh, I, I I took that advice. You know, when you guys were on the team, were on the pod, I had Slush Puppy, and you never know what you're going to get when you talk to Slush. And he was talking about killing right. kangaroos, and I took that and threw it up there. And yeah, you're it's it's amazing because, like you said, you have all this content and you can just slice it up. Exactly, I and mean, it's already there. Like you, yeah. it's not much extra work. You're already in the editing lab, cutting it all up anyway. Um, sorry, question, uh, Twitch partner. Yeah, your Twitch partner story. What's uh, what ended up happening was I grinded to the numbers required, which was 75 concurrent and, uh, I don't know, a certain amount of hours stream or something. I don't even remember. Yeah. Pretty much 75 concurrent was the main one. And then I applied, but my actual application got lost in the mail. Oh, no way. Because what happened was Twitch had like, um, Twitch had like restructured their backend servers from the old Justin TV yeah. to Twitch because Twitch used to be called Justin TV mm -hmm. um, before Twitch. Um, and so what happened was I applied, heard nothing for a week or two, then Slush applied, Slush got partner. I was sitting there like, well, I haven't even heard back. And then Slush got an email that had my name in it saying, oh, welcome, no like new partners. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, jeez. Righto. And then, and then, so uh, I got a message from someone. It's the Twitch, you, what, he was the Twitch manager for ANZ. He goes, oh, check your dashboard. And it was like, congratulations, you've been invited to the Twitch nice. partner program. And so yeah. it was cool. But yeah, that's um, cool. It's, that was the day I got partnered. I think it was like May 2018. It took me yeah. about four months of taking the, taking streaming seriously. Yeah. Nice. All right, so I want to talk something something that's really cool and special about, I think, what BSG and the Tarkov community brings to the table. And it's a charity. You know, if we look back to when you got that, you know, that that amazing December, I think it was two or three years ago, you, you know, your views exploded and you were doing your charity for Starlight. First of all, what is the Starlight charity? Starlight Children's Foundation Australia is a children's charity that um, they help seriously ill, seriously ill kids just be kids. So, for example, if you're in a hospital, you're really sick, um, they'll have uh, opportunities for the kids to actually enjoy their time as a, as a child in the hospital. So, got Starlight Express rooms. It's pretty much like a games room that kids go to. They're really, really well set up. Arts yeah. and crafts, mu music, um, and then they've got video games and stuff in there too. And they also got um, Starlight Captains. They're like the jesters of the hospital. And if the kid's too sick to go to the, to the room, the jesters will go up to the... Yeah. the actual kids and so then they keep the kids uh laughing in that and it the stories i've heard are amazing there is yeah it's one charity i 100 percent could back without any doubt and i've put i think i've donated over fifty thousand dollars my own money um actually probably more now and uh just really great like give me one sec yep we even went out of our way to uh, uh the firefighter yeah. candle uh calendars we got the firefighter <laughs> calendars here they're all I got got him to go out in the mail. I got a couple to go out in the mail. Nice. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, the web the link's taken down now. We took it down at the end of the year, but you know, like I, I like making money for this for this charity. 
They got really low admin fees. Uh, I think they got it down to under 4% or 3% yeah. administration fees, which is fucking awesome. Like, because charities out there at one point were getting like outed for doing 18%, you know, Holy like. Crap. Yeah, that's a business. Um, but, that's not a charity. Yeah, pretty much. So, and it's now just overall, great to see. Overall, how much have you raised, your community raised since, you know, since, you know, taking that charity under your wing? Hmm. In Australian dollars, I think we're around 1.8 million. I that think is... in US, that's probably about 1.2. Yeah. Well, it depended on the conversion rate at the time. Right. Probably about 1.1 to 1.2 US, yeah. which and is incredible. It is absolutely incredible. You know, gamers, you know, from Twitch and streaming. And I think this comes back to what, you know, our community, the Tarkov community has. It doesn't matter if you're S tier or just starting out. You've got everybody who's doing some sort of charity. And it's just so cool to see. And it's yeah it's amazing yeah um it, it really is amazing and and i, and I love the, i love to see it i it, it, i know this isn't meant to be like an advice thing and, and people don't want advice but i always feel like the best way to to raise as much money as possible for charity is uh not do them as often and try and try and um pick one yeah. pick one and learn everything about it because you asked me a question about starlight and i pretty much know the answer about it because I've met the, you know, the head of Starlight multiple times. She's lovely. Yeah. Um, I, I've spoken to multiple Starlight captains. The the administration team behind the doors, like the closed doors that you'd never even see. Yeah. I've been to the fucking Starlight Express room. Like, I've, I have I know this stuff. So when someone goes, oh, why should I donate? I can tell you why. Yeah. And I and I, and I believe in the, in the cause. And this is before I even had a child. Now I've got a child. Like, I couldn't have, I always thought, like, Imagine going through some sort of shit time. Like we've all done. Mm -hmm. We've all gone through something really fucking shitty in life. Now imagine doing that as a child whilst yeah. you're like hitting chemo. Yeah. You're like fuck that. Like that's something I couldn't imagine. If that like if that happens to my daughter. Yeah. Like I would want her to at least try and be a child at some time. Yeah. Important time. Yeah, it's amazing how your life changes when you leave that hospital for the first time and you look in the back seat and there's this baby. It's like there's no user manual. Everything. You, you know, how you watch the news, it just changes everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know. Like, I, I always, this is this is my kind of perspective. I was like, some people out there that probably got away with raising kids, that if they could do it, I could do it, you know? Like, <laughs> oh, oh. So, to the charity aspect, you know, one final piece. Do you, <clears throat> do you think Nikita or BSG understands of how many people they've affected because of, you know, this game that they've created and, and all the money and the, the careers, you know, that come from, you know, what has been created? I, I don't think BSG would have actually honestly thought initially that that game would impact so many people's lives. Yeah. Like, I think my interview with Nikita was back in... 2019 or 2018 when the first interview i had where i actually asked him about who he was where he came from how it got to where he was yeah and i think it started as a very small group of guys that just wanted to make this great game and it got yeah. to where it is now i don't think the kid would have honestly sat back down that sat down back then and gone oh you know we're gonna try and reach like have millions of people that have you know bought the game and you know change the lives and set up people's lives through content creation and you know like yeah. there's times where I know when Nikita's really excited to see our reactions yeah. and how the community takes like um you know like the the night where the, they uh it was a Twitter post of, they zoomed in on my head and uh they were watching me like they were all sitting there just watching it having a beer and or yeah. vodka and <laughs> enjoying their time you know like that's the the fruit of their labor and sitting back and and enjoying that yeah yeah, I still remember that night that or that you know day the drops happened and you hit a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand and chat was yelling at you to run commercials. It was just such a cool experience. Yeah, that was uh, the 2019 drops. I think yeah. I actually set a trend across uh, Twitch with that one. Yeah. So I was like, "You farm me for drops, I'll farm you for for ad <laughs> revenue." And um, it wasn't as much money as I thought it would be. Yeah. I think I ended up telling people how much it was. I think it was about sixteen thousand dollars I made. Yeah. Um. But it, it was, for me at that point, that was like, I remember it, it was, it was a large chunk of that monthly's revenue. Yeah. You know, and uh, that was like a holy shit moment, you know? 
And Pest, we're coming to the end of uh, our interview here. First of all, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thank you, and, dude. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah. And any uh, anything you want to give a shout out to that you know people should check out soon? Any new video coming? You know, we got the Euro European road trip happening. Will there be tour T-shirts? I don't have socials for the new the new content yet. Um, but if you are in Europe, keep an eye out because we will be going to nearly every country. And if you want to catch up, there'll be opportunities. Um, the main thing I would say is um, that the work that I'm going to put in this year isn't going to be very much primarily Tarkov focused, but it's going to be based around uh, living life to the fullest and enjoying every moment that we've got. So for me, this is more of a, a gift to myself than, yeah. than to you guys. <laughs> um, but hopefully you guys enjoy the journey because I'm going to be doing a lot of fun stuff. I'm going to be live streaming a lot of random shit. Like there's going to be times where I'm going to be you know, driving a car middle of the night and there'll be a live stream going on in the background where like sturdy, he's just like, I wish we were fucking there yet. I'm so over this shit. Or yeah. like, you know, we'll be climbing a mountain or a volcano or whatever it's doing. And it's just about us just going on a journey, you know, like yeah. kind of like the fellowship rings, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. but we don't have a Mordor. Yeah. We don't have a ring. Well, we got rings, but you know, like not, not the kind of drop into a lava pit. Anyway, moving on. Anyway, all right, so thank you for doing this. Now, um, at the end of my podcast, I ask the guests a shout out, somebody that they uh, want to throw under the bus or somebody they recommend to come in on the podcast. Who are you throwing out there? Um, you've done Bear K? No, I haven't. Bear K. Okay, there we go. We'll get her on. All right, Pess, have a great, uh, great rest of your, well, I guess you got a long day ahead of you. Thank you so much for yep. doing this. And thank you for BSG for, uh, for letting us use this platform. No worries. Thank you, BSG. Hey guys. I'm still All playing right. on video games on my, my stream. Just saying. <laughs>